It is indeed a proud privilege and honor to have in our midst the illustrious, dynamic, and versatile Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Dr. Tharoor is an award-winning author, a politician, former UN envoy, and human rights activist. His impeccable blend of wit, charm, and elegance makes him a globally recognized speaker. The sesquicentennial batch has the singular honor of having Dr. Shashi Tharoor to address them in his valedictory address. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome on stage Dr. Shashi Tharoor. The most reverend Dr. G. Daiva Shirvadam. Daiva Shirvadam must be the most appropriate name for a church leader I've ever come across. Professor John K. Zachariah, principal of Bishop Cotton School. Shiva Grover, the outstandingly impressive young outgoing captain of the school. Retiring staff. The very many distinguished guests here, too many to name. Teachers, dear students, the 551 of you, I've already tweeted a picture of some of you uh, at this ceremony before the light turned too dark. Prize winners today, parents, alumni of the school, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I hope that covers everybody. I know it's customary to say what a pleasure it is to be at any of occasion one is to address, but it really is a pleasure uh, to be at this incredibly impressive, splendid graduation ceremony on the sesquicentennial of this wonderful school. And I do want to thank Principal Zacharias for his extremely generous introduction of me a few minutes ago. It was the kind of praise that my late father would have been proud of, but only my mother would have believed. And it was delivered in the most splendid voice I have ever been introduced in, as I'm sure the students here testify, having no doubt heard it in many, in many other circumstances. I hope always pleasant ones, but one can never be sure with principles. I think to be told off in that voice must be the most terrifying experience any student has ever had. So it's a great incentive for good behavior. I uh, also want to say that um, it really is a pleasure to be here. It's, it's easily one of the most impressive ceremonies I have ever addressed. And believe me, I've had to address quite a few in my time. And this historic occasion, uh, marked by this graduating class of 551 boys, reminds me that the year 1865 was actually a pretty significant year in world history and Indian history. The end of the US Civil War was that year. The 13th Amendment to the American Constitution that abolished slavery was ratified that year. Lala Lajpat Rai, the great nationalist hero, was born that year. A census was conducted for the first time in the northwest provinces of India. And of course, your school was founded. Your school now ranked amongst the 100 best educational institutions in Asia. Uh, HAB was, was founded by the Reverend Samuel Taylor Pettigrew, obviously a very far-sighted clergyman from Cambridge University, and also a very modest one, since otherwise your school would be called Pettigrews and not Cottons. But there you are. He named it for whoever inspired him, the bishop. And of course, the name has now gained glory uh, over the, for 150 years, the illustrious list of alumni over a 14-acre campus. And I gather that your 6,000 schools, I was looking at the incoming school captain and thinking, my word, he is going to take over leadership of 6,000. That's not a small responsibility. 
and of course uh, the 500 members of faculty, which is a very, very good proportion in any school. And I, in reading about your school, was also struck by the fact that the school takes care of something like a thousand out of these 6,000 economically challenged students, um, including in other educational institutions, uh, providing scholarships and midday meals and uniforms and school books and so on. And I think this is a very welcome reminder that in an institution like this, one must always be conscious of one's responsibility beyond the walls of this prestigious institution. And I, I congratulate the school for the spirit it has shown here. Now, I've come from the world of politics, where, as you know, we are governed today by those who incline towards the right. And for the last 10 years, we were governed by many who tend to incline towards the left. So I'm very pleased that for 150 years, the school has managed to not stray from its moral compass and has stuck to neck dextrosum, neck sinistrosum, hmm? neither to the right nor to the left. Now, the center is where I usually find myself in our politics, so I was particularly happy to hear your slogan. The only problem, of course, is it's all very well to be middle of the road, but in India, if you're in the middle of the road, that's when you get run over by traffic in both directions. So I'm glad that Bishop Cottons has been slightly more fortunate than I have been. But let me do some of the formalities one must do on an occasion like this and start off by congratulating the prize winners whose talents and efforts were recognized today and to whom I was able to hand over the very impressive trophies that the school has been giving over the years, the rolling trophy, as well as the ones they can take home. And I know that looking at the quality of the school, that there must have been many others who didn't actually come onto the stage who have also done remarkably well. And I think that uh, while we appreciate the tremendous accomplishments of the ones who were recognized, one must also spare a thought for the ones who nearly made it and for one reason or the other ended up in second place. I want to tell you that I've had my share of first prize finishes, particularly throughout school and college. But in one of the big challenges of my life, the contest for the post of Secretary General, I was one of those who came second. I was the, the one who came second, two votes short of the victor in the first ballot. And uh, it's always struck me that uh, Groucho Marx's famous line, you know, when he said, close but no cigar, was particularly heartless. I don't smoke cigars as it happens. But the fact is that the cigar only goes to the one who comes first, not the one who came close. But there is no disgrace in coming close because it means you tried. It is a failure to try, the failure to make the attempt that I think is far, far, far more to be criticized or even pitied than the ones who did their best, didn't walk away with the cup, but know they did the best they can. And I'm going to come back to that theme. And I wanted to mention it right on because school prize givings can be very cruel affairs for those who don't get the prizes. But it's important for us to remember that they include a lot of people who pipped others to the post who might, in a different set of circumstances, be also deserving. But I have no doubt, I have tremendous faith in the quality of the school and the discernment of the principal to choose wisely the right winners. And I'm sure that the winners deserve our thunderous applause, which I invite you to collectively give them right now. At the same time, I'm very conscious that uh, the qualities that are awarded on stage are not the only qualities that make good citizens of India and therefore distinguished and proud alumni of the school. Because a school produces good students, but ultimately it has a great responsibility 
to produce good human beings. And I would hope that having seen the atmosphere of discipline, of values, of adherence to certain standards that characterized every aspect of this ceremony and this evening so far, that the school does indeed recognize and value the importance of producing good human beings. In school, we don't only learn in the classroom. We also learn on the playground. We learn on the way to and from school. We learn how to engage with other students, with our seniors and our peers. We learn how to engage with our teachers with the right combination of respect and challenge that is so important. And I say challenge advisedly because a good teacher always likes to be challenged. If the best student is always the one who regurgitates what the teacher has said, it seems to me the teacher has not done a good enough job of igniting the curiosity, the intellectual curiosity in the child to ask the question that has not been covered by the teacher. To ask about something which may not be in the textbook. We have a culture of respecting examinations in this country. And I blame teachers and parents equally for this because teachers often teach for the examinations and parents often judge children by how well they've done in the examination. So what marks have you brought back home in your report card? But you know, sometimes one loses sight of the fact that school is a preparation for a much bigger examination called life. And the examination of life has a nasty habit of asking you questions that weren't in the textbook you studied. And that examination called life requires you to apply yourself beyond what the teacher has told you in the classroom and what's in the textbook. It involves your being able to absorb information, unfamiliar information that you didn't prepare for, but that you have to absorb and synthesize and respond to in passing the examinations life throws up. I was struck that one of the students who got a prize today was praised for being a problem solver. He was one of the prefects. And I told him as I shook his hand, that's a great asset. People need problem solvers in life. The world needs problem solvers. And the truth is that when you come out of school, come out not only prepared to pass examinations, come out prepared to solve problems, including the problems you haven't prepared for. Because in many ways, the truly educated mind is the mind that has thought beyond what it has learned in the classroom. The true mark of education on your mind is what is left behind after you've forgotten everything you studied for the examinations. And that, to my mind, is something that a good school also instills in its students. Character, values, the moral compass, the problem-solving trait, self-reliance, an interest in activities going beyond the textbook and the examinations. I was so pleased to give a prize to a young man who, it was described by the announcer, had literary pursuits. And I, I asked him, so do you write stories? And he said, yes. And it brought me back to my own childhood when as an asthmatic child in an India before the advent of television, computers, handheld Nintendo games, and so on, when books were the only refuge for a child who was wheezing, couldn't sleep, and couldn't go out to play because of the asthma. That when I ran out of books, because I was the eldest child in the family, I read every one of my parents' books that I could understand. And whenever my parents took me to the library, I read so inconveniently fast, I finished the book in the car on the way home. I started writing, because that was the only option available. There was no other distraction. And I was so fortunate that my parents encouraged that. Instead of dismissing these scribblings as the time pass of an ill child, which is at bottom what they were. 
My father got the stories typed up so I could share them with friends and pass them around. He made me feel that whatever little talent I was showing in my words was worth encouraging. And I urge parents here that the interests and passions of your children outside the classroom deserve as much encouragement as their accomplishments at Bishop Cotton's. I hope that when they come to school and they, they draw or they write or they paint or they run or they sing or they tell jokes in a way that amuse people or play the guitar or seek to do things that seem to you perhaps to show some spark of talent that others don't possess. Please encourage it. Please nurture it. Please let them feel that this is also worth doing and that you will not only judge them by the trophies they come home with and the first or second mark uh, in the examinations that they might have acquired. And I must say that um, the quality of the distinguished alumni, Bishop Cottons, suggests that the school gets most things right already. And the parents, and already young uh, Shiva Grover has already said all the right words about parents, which parents here deserve to hear. I hope that the parents will also do the right thing by their kids and encourage the other talents that perhaps the school has already helped give some initial expression to, but the parents will help flourish outside as well. At the same time, I want to go back to that initial reference to the help the Bishop Cottons gives the underprivileged. Because when you come out of a school with one of the best educations you can get in India, you are automatically joining an elite, an elite that is fortunate enough to be educated and to be educated well. But I hope that all of you, and I say this not just to the graduates, but to the ones who will continue from class 10 on to 11 and 12, I hope that you will remember your continuing responsibility to those outside whom you may encounter who haven't had the good fortune of getting into a school like Bishop Cotton's. I remember when I was in school an awfully long time ago now, five decades, we were always inspired by a slogan that came from Swami Vivekananda, each one teach one. And even as a young school student, I would try and go home and teach the domestic servants' children a few letters of the English language in the hope that it might serve them in good stead, or if they didn't know the Hindi language, that, that too was something I felt I could do. And the same applies to whatever other language your domestic helpers might have, or if not domestic helpers, people in your neighborhood whom you might come across who could benefit from that. If we could teach every child in India the alphabet, and if we could teach every old person in India who missed out on learning the alphabet when they were a child, think what a magical transformation that would bring about in our country. And every one of you here is equipped to do that. I still remember during my stint in the Human Resource Development Ministry going to a, a village adult resource center in Tamil Nadu. And I met a young woman who, I beg your pardon, a not very young woman, she was in her 50s, who uh, had been taught the alphabet quite recently and was very proud of it. And she pulled out her slate and she wrote her name in Tamil for me. And I was so pleased that this mattered so much to her. And I said, so what does being literate mean to you? How, does it, how has it changed your life? So you can write your name, but you know, somebody else could have written your name for you. What, what has changed in life? And she said something that I'll never, I'll never forget. She said, when I want to travel to the nearest town, which was Kanjiburam, I can go to the bus stop and I can read the names of the destinations on the buses myself. I don't have to ask somebody all the time, is that bus going to Kanjiburam? A very simple thing, but it's an illustration of the degree of empowerment that merely being able to decipher letters. A 50-year-old woman who had been unable to know which bus to get on, but the magic of literacy has given her that. If you children can go on and make your contribution to that to some people, it seems to me we will have a triumph and a satisfaction that I promise you few other things in your life will give you. 
The fact is that uh, we live in a country in which there is a great deal to be proud about, a great deal to be proud of, and a lot of things to be not so proud of. And the fact is that the question of what it is that we should be proud of is one that tends to bedevil us in India. Right now, we've just seen the unseemly controversy of the Indian Science Congress, where some people presented fanciful claims, suggesting that ancient India had aircraft thousands of years before the internal combustion engine was even invented. It was a scientific impossibility they were advancing. Or they claimed, a person in a very distinguished position of public office claimed, that the image of Lord Ganesha with his elephant head on a male on a human body proved that ancient Indians were masters of plastic surgery. Clearly he had never heard of the use of metaphor, but I'm sure that you kids have been taught that already in school. Now in debunking or criticizing such exaggerated claims, some of our Indians have gone to the opposite extreme. And they have in fact also criticized legitimate claims of actual accomplishments by the ancient Indians, which should, in fact, be matters of great pride for us. I don't know how many of you kids have had a chance to learn Roman numerals, but I'm sure you've realized that one of the great problems with Roman numerals is they do not have an ending. They just keep going on and on and on. They're useless for mathematical calculations. It was ancient India that invented that indispensable construct the zero. And with the zero, the entire world of mathematics was transformed. The Arabs learned numbers from us, the decimal system from us, from our forebears. And that's why the Western world who got them from the Arabs calls them Arabic numerals, but they really began in India. Al Khwarizmi, who wrote the initial textbooks that gave the world what is known as algebra, in his writings paid tribute to the unknown and unsung Indians who had invented these mathematical concepts. Indians invented the science of astronomy, not just astrology. I used to joke that uh, astrology is a real big science because an Indian without a horoscope is like an American without a credit card, you know, a terrible disability in life. But the truth is, the truth is that in fact in astronomy we were no slouches. And Aryabhatta in the 5th century AD actually anticipated the discoveries of Copernicus, Kepler, and indeed of Galileo, who a thousand years after Aryabhatta was still being denounced as heretics for arguing propositions that Aryabhatta had precisely established. So the ancient Indians have done a great deal of things, but rather than merely reveling in the accomplishments of the past, we need to ask ourselves, where have we lost that capacity? We can boast about the magnificent town planning of the Indus Valley, but we look at our unplanned, chaotic, overcrowded, dirty towns in, of, of, of India today, and there is no great satisfaction in telling ourselves that we had beautiful, clean, pristine, grid laid down cities with perfect sanitation systems 4,000 years ago, which we did, but if we lost the habit and the art of building that today, we have to worry about what we can do today. I'm, I'm, I'm not anxious to belabor the point. I do believe we should take pride in our past, but I believe it is more important to work to a present and a future that we and the next generation can be proud of. And that is where this wonderful symbolic ceremony of handing over the mantle of responsibility comes in. Because each graduation is in a sense a reminder that the responsibilities are being passed on, that the torch is being passed on to a new generation. The 17 and 18 and 16 year olds here already represent the Indian majority. Because a majority of India's population is closer to them in age than to their parents. The majority of India's population today is actually under 25. 65% of India's population is under 35. And if you look at just the age group between 10 and 19, and most of the kids here have 
belong to that cohort. If you just look at that age group, there are 225 million of them in India. And they represent both our greatest hope and our greatest challenge. Our greatest hope as a country because if they acquire the education and the training to seize the opportunities that the world of the 21st century can offer them, they can transform India, they can transform the world. They can be the agents of ensuring that India will finally fulfill the potential that we all know we're capable of. I don't want to only be able to boast that we were the USA of the third century BC, which we probably were. I want to be able to say that we are in no way inferior to the USA or the China or the Japan of the 21st century. And they can make that happen. But unfortunately, not everyone in that age group has had the opportunities and the education that Bishop Cottons has given these young people. We have a lot of young boys who have not gone to good schools and some who have gone to no school at all.